welcome to uh, the signature session, the second session this morning, uh, that will consist of four talks. Um, so the first talk is going to be on rejection sampling in Lubashevsky's signature scheme uh, by uh, Julien Devey, Omar Fauzi, Alain Baslag, and Damien Stelé. And uh, Julien is going to give the talk. Please go ahead. Hello. Ah. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. So this is joint work with Omar Fozzi, Anna Pasek, and uh, And this time you'll understand what we meant with the target and plastic gun in the abstract video. So just to briefly summarize the work, what we tried to do is optimize the Fiat Shamir with a board paradigm in the lattice setting. Uh, we basically tried to optimize everything we could think of, so the runtime and the signature sizes. Uh, we did so by formally studying how rejection sampling is used in this setting. And spoiler alert, here are our results. So basically, runtime is optimal and compactness, we have some lower bounds and how to reach them because they were not reached. Uh, and last question is why we were interested in this in the first place. So generic motivation is Dilithium, which is a future PQ standard from the NIST. It's implementing this Fiat Shamir with rewards paradigm. And more broadly, rejection sampling is an interesting uh, technique that's been used in cryptography in lots of different places. So we thought that it could be interesting to like open the black box to see how it was working and if it was actually suited to our needs. So I'm going to briefly recall the signature scheme. Uh, then I move to how we minimize the number of rejects, so op how to optimize the runtime. And then I'll show you how to uh, minimize the signature size. Okay, so let's start with the signature scheme, which will be a bit more generic than when we that what we could, you could have seen before. Um, so the scheme is relying on the short integer solution problem. The most important thing here is basically that this problem relies on the shortness of some vector, and the smaller this vector is, smaller the bound beta is, well, the harder the problems become. It will have some uh, effect in the following of the talk. So let's go. Uh, here's the key generation algorithm. You take a random matrix A, a, sm a small matrix S, or some meaning of small, and you get the secret key. Verification key will be A and an A times S. OK. Uh, the signing algorithm asks you to first take a short vector Y from some generic distribution. So that's where we'll be able then to play uh, by changing the distribution Q, we'll get different signature sizes. So it's really important. And then you have the following formula for the signature. Uh, most importantly, so you're going to compute some challenge C and the answer to the challenge is the vector Z, uh, which is Y plus S times C. I don't have uh, really time nor the need to show you the verification algorithm. But the only thing I need to, when you need to know is that as long as this vector z has some bounded norm, then we can make a verification algorithm that makes the scheme correct. Uh, if you want some concrete instantiation, well, previous works instantiated Q with Gaussian distributions, or what I will call hypercube uniform distributions. And if we keep it like that, then the scheme is not secure. OK, uh, because we don't have a bots yet. Uh, and as you can see, Z is leaking the secret key. Uh, so ideally, what we would like to have is to make sure that Z is independent from the secret. So we would like Z to follow some kind of target distribution P, which is independent from S. And there are two main ways to achieve that. Uh, the first technique is flooding. If you take Q with a very large standard deviation, then the shift S times C is almost unnoticeable. And then, uh, yeah, Z is almost independent from the secret. But 
then you get a very large gamma, which basically drives the size of the signature. So that's not what we want. The other uh, technique that we will discuss is rejection sampling. But in both cases, as soon as signature is uncorrelated with the secret key, then it basically means that you cannot get query the signature algorithm because those, those signatures are uninteresting. And then uh, the signature is secure. Okay, so now let's move to how we use rejection sampling, how it's defined and everything. So in the following, I will give some kind of broader setting which, which can applies to actually anything and it can be not related to signatures. Uh, so the broader context is as follows. I give you access to lots of samples that all follow the same source distribution and your task is to find any sample that is uh, following some target distribution. And of course, you want to use as few samples as possible because each sample will be one signature. And of course, you're not allowed to modify the samples because those are signatures. So I mean, at some point you will verify them. So if you modify the signatures, maybe the verification algorithm will not pass anymore. And so while I explain how to do so, we will also see how to so minimize the average number of samples you need, which basically drives the runtime of the signing algorithm in the batch of key signature. Uh, so the technique, the generic technique, which we will call imperfect rejection sampling is as follows. So you have the source distribution D tilde, and you're going to scale it by some factor M until almost all of the blue curve is over the green curve, okay? Then imperfect rejection sampling, it tells you it, it can be seen as some kind of Monte Carlo technique. So you get a sample X, it gives you some abscissa, and with some probability, which represents sampling an ordinate, you will keep it or not. Uh, to keep it, it, you only keep it if it's under the green curve here or else you restart. Okay, and you will get something that almost follows the distribution D and hopefully it will be close enough. Uh, to study how big M must be, we introduce something that we call the smooth string divergence. It can be seen as generalization of the Rennie divergence. Uh, it, there's a lot of math here, but it just means you, you take the smallest M possible such that everything up to some Epsilon part is under the blue curve. Okay, uh, we can take an example, for instance, to see what is going on. So if you take two Gaussian distributions, but one is slightly shifted with respect to the other, uh, what you can do is remove the left part, the tail on the left, and then you can slightly shift the blue one until it's over the, the green one. And of course, the larger epsilon will be, the more of the tail you remove. And so the smaller M you will need to take. Um, okay, we actually have a concrete formula that we compute. Uh, it's just that it's a bit too big to write here. Okay, uh, so then we can, so then we studied how efficient this technique is. So first we look at the runtime. So the, we have this uh, computation. So assuming that you are uh, doing things correctly, so you took M big enough, then your average number of samples will be at most M over one minus epsilon. And if you focus on the case where epsilon is zero, then this is actually optimal. Even if you were to do different strategies, maybe go back to previous samples or whatever, uh, this would not be faster. Um, we don't really have a, uh, the same result for non-zero epsilon, but epsilon will typically be two to the minus 64. So it should, uh, even if imperfect rejection sampling is not optimal, um, we don't think it's worth looking for a more optimal strategy. And something that will help me move to the next part is we study the quality of the resulting distribution, which is not exactly the target D, 
Uh, previously, people looked at the statistical distance between the two distributions. We choose to look at the rainy divergence because rainy divergence is, uh, in general, more, help, more helpful and leads to tighter security proofs in the case of signatures. So that's what we did. Okay. So now we move to uh, we move back to the signature and we move to a different topic because now we know that rejection sampling uh, works and that it is it is quite fast. So we have the following optimization problem. Okay, uh, I'm going to details all of those terms. So first, we are going to fix some value m. It represents actually how much resource you want to put inside the signature scheme. It will be the average number of rejects. And you want rejection sampling to work whatever shift you will have. So you need to take the maximum, uh, need to take M bigger than the maximum uh, of all possible shifts that you will have, okay? Next is why do we take epsilon at most one over QS, which is the number of signature queries? It's because if you re remember the quality analysis, uh, when you plug in the fact that you will do QS signatures and everything, then you do the security proof. So you indeed find the tighter security proof with rainy divergence rather than statistical distance. And it allows you to take epsilon a bigger of one over QS. Okay. Uh, then the first condition that we have here, if you remember, it's actually the condition that you need for correctness. Okay, so this defines the gamma, and actually you want to minimize it because it's really what drives uh, the signature size. Uh, because here we just omit the size of the challenge because it's just a, a hash, so we don't have really, thing, really anything we can do on it. So we're just going to minimize gamma. And there is some kind of p-school effect because when you minimize gamma, if you remember, uh, I said that the cis problem gets harder when you have a smaller bound. So you have a smaller gamma, cryptanalysis becomes harder, and then you can actually drop some dimensions or something to keep the same level of security. So it gets even better. Okay, and uh, our lower bound is that when you take zero, epsilon equals zero, then if you want to satisfy everything, you have the following lower bound, which is related to the maximal uh, size of the bound of the shift. And we can now take a look at the choices of distributions that were uh, done in previous works to see if they reach this lower bound or not. Uh, so the two, the two choices that were made, if you remember, it's hypercube uniform, which is the choice made in Dilithium, because you have an easy, I mean, it's easy to sample from uh, ranges. It's easy to check if you have to reject or not, but you have a uh, bad uh, compactness. And this compactness is not even scaling when epsilon grows. So it's not, the distribution we are looking for. Uh, so maybe Gaussian is better uh, because here it's a bit harder to sample and reject. You need to compute some exponential, etc. And actually you can't use Gaussians in a perfect setting when epsilon is zero. So you don't reach the lower bound either. So we don't really know. We have a much better value. It's scaling very well with epsilon, but since we're starting from plus infinity, we don't know if this scaling is optimal or not. Okay, so we actually have a proposal which is to use the uh, uniform distribution in hyperboles. Because if we do so, so we see that when epsilon is zero, we reach we reach the lower bound, and when epsilon and it's actually scaling with epsilon at least as good as the Gaussian, so it's quite interesting. Uh, we also keep the deterministic rejection test. So that's also, that's like a good bonus. And to give you some intuition on why we do this choice, well, it's because we are looking at Euclidean norms. So it's natural to replace hypercubes, which are fitting with infinite norm, with hyperboles, which are good for Euclidean norm. 
Uh, and also it is scaling well with epsilon because we have some kind of nice geometry going on with hyperspherical caps or everything. Uh, and then to put things into perspective, we also looked at some practical parameters because just its asymptotics could not let us determine what, what was better between Gaussians and hyperboles. And actually practical parameters don't help either because they are very similar. Uh, to compute these parameters, we based our computations on Divisium and the Gaussian variants. We introduced a hyperbole variant just for computations of sizes. Uh, and also those, the, those two last lines uh, plugged some all the improvements we've made in the computations. So we have larger epsilon. And also something I didn't say is that we slightly improved the computation of the smooth divergence for Gaussians, so we can take them little bit smaller. Okay, uh, to wrap things up, we have even more results in the paper. So for instance, we look at bliss. Uh, we also have some kind of compromise between rejection sampling and flooding. And we also look at what we can do if we use continuous distributions, uh, because then we have even more choices for P and Q. So we looked at whether that was interesting or not. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer them. So we do have uh, plenty of time for questions. So maybe I'll start. So do you have a concrete proposal for actually instantiating the, the sampling in, in so I guess it's the intersection between uh, between the Euclidean ball and the uh, and the uh, z to the n lattice. So actually, uh, when we looked at those sizes, uh, so we are actually using okay, we are actually using uh, the uniform continuous ball, and then when you want to instantiate that, indeed, you will. I mean, you have different ways of doing it. You can either just uh, intersect with C to the N, or you can uh, do some kind of discretization with maybe one over some big N, Z to the N. Uh, and of course, the larger big N will be, the closer you will be to this, uh, to this optimal sizes from the uniform hyperbole. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, if not, then let's thank the speaker again. So our next talk is entitled um, Hawk. Uh, module module leap makes uh, lattice signatures fast, uh, compact, and simple. Oh no, sorry, it's uh, Sphinx Plus. Oh, sorry, my apologies. So it's uh, recovering the tight security proof of Sphinx Plus. I. Uh, Mihail Kudinov, uh, Andreas, and Andreas will sing, and Mihail will give the talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, today I'm going to present a joint work with uh, Andreas Hulsing on the recovering the tight security proof of Sphinx Plus. So first we, give, we will give a brief dis uh, dis description of uh, Sphinx Plus construction. And then uh, we will analyze uh, the security flow in the previous proof of security of Sphinx Plus. Then we will discuss uh, the key ideas that helps us to fix the proof. 
and we will finish our talk uh, by analysis of uh, hash functions and the properties used to prove the security of Sphinx. So for those who don't know, Sphinx Plus is a hash-based digital signature scheme. Uh, and it was recently chosen uh, by NIST for standardization as a post-quantum alternative for signature uh, schemes. Uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main reason why it was chosen, it, since it is a very conservative and a secure choice, and uh, uh, other uh, signature schemes still rely on hashing, and in Sphinx Plus, nothing but a secure hash function is required. Uh, so during the third round, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a security flaw found in the proof of security. Uh, this flaw didn't lead to an attack. Uh, there was still a non tight proof, which was still applicable. Uh, but uh, uh, using that proof will lead to around 60 bits of security loss. So our aim was to recover a tight security proof. Uh, and now we will discuss uh, the Sphinx Plus construction how different building uh, blocks uh, are combined to obtain a more effective uh, scheme. And then we will come back to the security flaw and how we fixed it. So the first building block uh, is a one-time signature scheme. Uh, everything started with the uh, Lampert scheme, which is a one-time signature scheme used to sign a one bit of information. You have uh, two secret values, uh, which are hashed. The secret values form the secret key, the hash values form the public key, and to sign one bit of information, you just use a corresponding part of the secret key. Uh, to verify the signature, you hash it and check if it is equal to the corresponding part of the public key. This can be expanded to get uh, a signature scheme for n bit uh, messages, but then you will need two n bit uh, secret values. Uh, Winternits found a way to optimize this. So in Lampert scheme, you have uh, two hash values to sign one bit of information. And in Lampert scheme, you have uh, one hash value to sign log W bits of information. So here we have uh, L secret values. Each of them are used to form a hash chain. This is done by sequ sequentially hashing uh, the secret value W minus one times. And to sign the message, uh, special encoding is performed, which is then represented as uh, L values between zero and W minus one. And the signature reveals uh, the corresponding blocks in the, each of the chains. To verify the signature, you again perform the encoding. It's a base W representation. That's, that way you understand at which positions are the signature blocks, and you do the rest of the hashing to obtain the ends of the chains. Then you check if the ends of the chains are equal to the public key, and if it's so, uh, then the signature is valid. So the main security idea behind the what signature is that if, you will, if the attacker will forge the signature, he will need to find at least one block uh, on a lower level in at least one chain. Uh, so the second building block is uh, Merkle trees. So on this slide, you can see how they're built. Uh, it, they're built from the leaves. You hash two values together, and you do so until you get to the root of the tree. Uh, in Sphinx Plus, the leaves are public keys of uh, one-time signature scheme, in our case, SWATS. Uh, yes, and another key feature of uh, Merkle trees is authentication pass. Authentication pass uh, contain nodes that help you to compute the root of the tree. So on this slide, uh, the, you can see the purple leaf and the authentication pass for that leaf will contain the yellow nodes. Uh, so using Merkle trees, we can obtain multiple time signature scheme that allows us uh, to sign the mess, uh, several messages. Uh, you use uh, an instance uh, of one time signature to sign the message. And you also uh, put the authentication pass into the signature. But this is a stateful scheme. Uh, that means you have to keep track which instances you have already used. And uh, you should not use them twice. Now we're ready to get the whole Sphinx Plus construction. So uh, Merkle trees are combined in so-called hyper tree. So you have diff different layers. And let's look at the top layer. There you have the Merkle tree, which is built from uh, one-time signature instances. 
they are used to sign the roots of the Merkle trees from on the lower level. And this goes on, for example, on the picture, you can see two layers, but this can be more layers there. And the one-time signature instances from the bottom layer are used to sign a few times signature public keys. So few times signature scheme uh, is a stateless scheme where you can sign a few signatures. Uh, usually, for example, in Sphinx, uh, around eight times you can use it, and then the security slowly decreases. And then a uh, few times signature scheme is then used to sign the message. So the digest of the message determines which instance of few times signature scheme is actually used. And then the signature contains the few times signature, uh, the what signatures and the corresponding authentication pass. Uh, to check the signature, the verifier uh, tries to compute the root of the uh, Merkle tree at the top level. And uh, if it's equal, then the signature is valid. So again, uh, this, there was a security flaw in the proof. And uh, the, the flaw uh, was in the part that proof uh, what security. Uh, so let's uh, look at this in more details. So first, uh, let's discuss how hashing is done in Sphinx Plus. Instead of using key hash functions, so-called tweakable hash functions are used. They take three inputs, public parameter, tweaks, and the message, and produce a digest. So the public parameter is a bit string that is a part of uh, Sphinx plus uh, public key. Uh, and uh, the same uh, public parameter used in every tweakable hash function call for the same uh, key pair. And uh, yes, so uh, the public parameter is there to separate uh, different keys of different users. And this is uh, a step towards multi-user security. Then the second parameter is tweak. Uh, the main idea of tweak is that is different in every tweakable hash function call. Uh, so uh, it helps uh, for to, to mitigate uh, multi-target attacks. So it uh, performs kind of a domain separation. So imagine we had only just one simple hash function to do all the hashing in Sphinx Plus. Then, uh, for example, finding a pre-image for at least one value in this big construction would be much easier. And the uh, tweak helps us uh, to separate uh, these calls. Uh, so let's first take a look at the non tight proof. Uh, first, the idea was the following. Uh, you guess what message uh, will be asked for the signing, the signing query. And you place a pre-image challenge at the position of uh, in one chain at the position that you guess that the block will be that you will need to reveal in the signing query and uh, then if there is a forgery as we uh, mentioned before uh, the adversary will help have to reveal a block which is uh, lower so he will have to make a longer chain for that for that uh, part of the signature and uh, there are two possible ways either Either the forgery will collide before uh, your signature block, or it will collide afterwards. If it collides before, then we found the pre-image uh, for that block. If it collides afterwards, this can be handled with a second pre-image resistance property. But yes, here, uh, the problem is that we have to guess which block we will have to reveal in the signature. And uh, for one instance of what's the, the guessing probability is one over L tau. L times W, but in Sphinx Plus, we have a lot of instances of what's, and then we will have to guess not only the position in the instance, uh, in, in the what's instance, but also which what's will be forged. So this is where the 60 bits loss of security comes from. So to, um, to avoid this guessing, the idea was to uh, construct the whole chain from the second pre-image resistance challenges. And the idea was the following. Let's assume that the tweakable hash function uh, has this property that for every output, we have two pre-images. Yes, real world hash functions doesn't have this property, but uh, there are ways to overcome this. And just for the ease of explanation, just assume that, yes, we have uh, for every output, we have two pre-images. And assume we have a perfect adversary that can find pre-images with 100% probability. 
Then when I have my second pre-image resistance challenge, I can just submit the output to our pre-image finder. And with probability at least one half, he will produce the solution for our pre-image. Uh, this is due to the fact that uh, the input that I already know is information theoretically hidden from the adversary. And uh, this idea was used uh, uh, in the proof. And uh, so we construct our chain with these second pre-image challenges and uh, hope that when the adversary will forge our signature, we will find a solution for the second pre-image resistance challenge. But the problem is now that uh, since we have this uh, chaining of, hash of hashes, uh, the pre-image that we already know might not be hidden from the adversary. So assume the situation that one of the pre-images is in the range of uh, hash function outputs and the second pre-image is not, then uh, the adversary can determine which one you already know and give that solution to you. Uh, so, so yes, uh, the key idea that helped us to obtain uh, tight security proof was to observe that what's uh, is used to sign the roots of the Merkle trees in the Sphinx structure. So the adversary doesn't have any control on those values. And that's why we can prove the security of what's in a weaker model, which is called UNACMA. And in this model, the adversary has to perform all the signing queries before he sees the public key. So in this case, we don't have to guess anymore we place uh, pre-image challenges for each position in the chain. And again, uh, there are two possible ways. Either the collision happens before uh, the signature block, then we, we find the pre-image solution, or it happens afterwards. Uh, that we handle with uh, multi-target target collision resistance, which is can be viewed as yes, yeah, second pre-image resistance kind, but yeah. Uh, some of you may notice that due to our challenge placement, the distribution of the blocks and the public keys uh, could have changed. Uh, this we handle with the notion called uh, undetectability, which essentially declares that uh, uh, the output of a tweakable hash function on a random input is uh, computationally indistinguishable from a random string. Uh, another underlying problem uh, in proving uh, things plus is that uh, again, in Sphinx Plus, we have multiple instances of what's, and um, so they, all, they all share the same public parameter, and uh, some of them are used to sign the messages which are um, dependent on the what's public keys of other instances. And uh, since we cannot, um, we don't know the public parameter until we place all the challenges, we cannot compute those dependencies just as it is. So we introduce a th lambda oracle, which is initialized with the same public parameter as in the, as in the challenges. And um, the adversary can query this oracle with tweaks and messages, but there are restrictions. The adversary cannot query it with the same tweaks that are used in the challenges. So the idea behind this is that we allow the adversary to query our tweakable hash function, but only for the tweaks that are not useful for the challenges. So this can be viewed as querying just independent hash function. Uh, so on the slide, you can see the final theorems. We proved uh, these multiple instances of what's uh, security. And then uh, when we proved it, we could just plug in that part in the things plus security. Uh, the rest of the proof remained the same. Uh, on the slide, you can also see there is a W factor in, in front of undetectability notion. This is due to the hybrid argument, but the W is uh, very usually a small value, which is either 16, maybe 256 at most. Uh, so this is uh, just a tiny loss. Uh, another important thing that we did is we updated uh, the status of uh, uh, security properties. Uh, so uh, in our proof, we're using, we're using non-standard properties like typical collision resistance or pre-image resistance for one target we're using a more complex ones. So we have to analyze uh, how hard it will be for the adversary to break them. To do so, we analyze how hard it will be to break such properties for random functions. And uh, we update the bounds for uh, multi-target target collision resistance and the multi-target undetectability. 
Uh, another thing to look at is uh, the constructions of tweakable hash functions. So um, tweakable hash functions that uh, Sphinx Plus proposed two possible constructions of tweakable hash functions from key hash functions. And uh, there was an analysis uh, what are the requirements on the key hash functions uh, to obtain the needed properties of tweakable hash functions? But Sphinx Plus didn't use uh, pre-image resistance and, detect and detectability in their proof. So we also had to complete this part. Uh, so yes, in uh, our work, we uh, recovered the uh, tight proof of security for Sphinx Plus. We updated the quantum generic security of used properties for multi-target target collision resistance and multi-target undetectability. We also analyzed the constructions of tweakable hash functions and the connections between the properties. And uh, some uh, ideas for the future work is that uh, they can be done in computer-aided proof. And so uh, my colleagues already done a crucial part of uh, security proof and verified. So the update is already verified uh, in EasyCrypt. And also what you could do is you could analyze the uh, used properties regarding the hash function construction, maybe merkel Damgrad, maybe sponge functions. So, and analyze what are the requirements there to obtain the needed properties. So thank you for your attention. Any questions? So we have time for questions, anyone? We don't have, we don't seem to have any questions. So let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so this time, the next talk is going to be a uh, hawk. Uh, so module leap uh, makes lazy signatures fast, compact, and simple. Uh, the paper is by uh, Leo Duca, Imon Postelweis, uh, Ludo Poules, and uh, Vessel van Vorden. And uh, Ludo is going to give the talk. Hi. Okay. Yeah, I will talk about uh, the signature scheme, and it's based on a module version of the lattice isomorphism problem. Um, so first, let's start off with uh, the Miss PQC signature finalists. Um, of these, Falcon is the smallest, but um, despite this, NIST still recommended the lithium. Um, yeah. Why is this? So Falcon. Uh, it's a hash and sign um, signature scheme. And what this means um, is that for signing, uh, you have a message. You hash this message to some target in a lattice uh, or just in a space. And then uh, signing is sampling a nearby lattice point uh, with a good basis, proper basis. And then verification is checking um, that the same targets you acquire is first of all in the lattice uh, and you can check this with a bad basis and then you check if this target is close to the signature and yeah so it has a small piece in signature falcon however this sampling step in signing that's a bit complicated because this requires high precision floats for the uh, discrete gaussian step they use and if you want to emulate these floats, so this is on constraint devices that don't have floating point support. Um, this emulation step is quite slow and that gives a slowdown for Falcon in these devices. And uh, also if you want to mask this kind of stuff, it also becomes difficult. And this, this comes from the, the fact of the, the class of lattices they use, the entry lattices. And yeah, what was kind of the starting point for a project was that we just wanted to have like an easy lattice to sample from, such as Z to the N, integer lattice. And this is almost like the easiest 
letters you can think of to, to sample from. Um, however, everybody knows the, the good basis on the integer letters. So how can you build a signature scheme out of this? Uh, that's a good question. So our idea was to hide the integer lattice by a rotation and make this rotation function. So this is kind of the normal picture. On the left, you have the, the trapdoor basis in green, and on the right, uh, you construct the bad basis, uh, red, and that becomes the public key. But now this, this good basis is not the secret key anymore. Um, but instead, we rotate the public key. And now the secret key is the rotation that is used. Um, right. And so the security is based now on the lattice isomorphism problem. And this is when you know that two uh, lattices are isomorphic. And you have some basis uh, that describes them. You have to find the rotation that maps one lattice to the other. And in terms of bases, this becomes uh, this equation where you have to find also a unimodular transformation u that maps one basis to the other after the rotation. So now it seems like the problem has become worse. We introduced more floating point numbers in the rotation. Therefore, also p prime also has floating points. Um, but we can also fix this the, by making this embedding implicit. So the, this B prime, we don't actually make this a public key. Keep it implicit, but we keep the geometry of the lattice. And what I mean with this is that we look at the, the gram matrix of B prime. So if you perform a rotation of your lattice, it's gram matrix containing all the, the inner products of the basis vectors. Um, this stays the same, as you can see. And this gram matrix uh, can be made public. And this transformation is now kept as a secret. And when you ever want to get back to the basis uh, described by this Q prime, you can take the Cholesky decomposition. This is giving you a basis that is upper triangular if you use column notation. And there was a previous work in last script that showed a generic way to, uh, if you have a lattice where you can sample from, um, they provide a way to make a signature scheme on this lattice uh, where the security is based on some variant of lib, where you have to decide if some lattice is isomorphic to one or the other. Um, however, uh, yeah, so in the case of set to the n here, the secret key is this transformation. And the public key is then u transpose times u, because the initial basis was the, was the identity matrix. So it becomes somewhat simpler. Um, but the question is now to, to make this, this uh, previous work competitive to the other NIST candidates. Uh, that's, that's where this work comes in. So how do, yeah, how do you do this? What are the steps? Uh, so first of all, uh, we had an add extra structure to the integer lattice. And so we add a ring structure to it and that makes everything better. Uh, we also have some compression techniques we used the keys and also on the signature and last but not least we hash two targets in half the integer lattice and this allows us to uh, use two samplers the one for z and one for z plus a half and uh, this is quite a major improvement because then you have a constant time sampler you sample just from both and then depending on which one you need it you actually use so yeah, that, that gives quite a speed up in practice. So first point, the extra structure, that's that we go to a ring version and we don't take uh, a module of rank one, of rank two, 
So we do the standard trick of taking a, a cyclotomic ring of power of two degree. And here the secret, the unimodular transformation is two basis vectors. So they're all, all live in the ring. The first, the small f and g are sampled from a discrete Gaussian with a small sigma. And then to find the capital F and G, we want to complete uh, this, this matrix by solving the entry equation. Um, and this determinant has to be one to make it an invertible matrix. And the solving this equation was actually done before. So we can use Falcon's B generation code and apply it to our case by only changing what they had a prime uh, Q. We change that to one. So it kind of loses its meaning in our case. Also, because we don't use a Q where we let this anymore, but the instant. And now, yeah, this public key is taken by you star you and kind of can think about this star as being the, the transpose in the module case. So next step compression. Um, also like Falcon, we can drop one of the secret key parts, the capital G, because the determinant was one in our case. And in the public key, we now have a two by two matrix and this may sound big, but we have, we have a symmetry property. So we can drop one of the four. And then we can also drop the Q11. And this is because the determinant of U was one. Also the determinant of this quadratic form Q is one. And that allows us to drop this Q11 as well. So now you only have half F. And we can also drop half of the signature. And this can be done by um, a round off algorithm. So from Hessian sign, the signature is a nearby lattice point. And if we have fixed half of the signature, the other part of the signature has to be some uh, lattice point that makes the signature close to the target. And this can be used in verification. And what's more important is that we can also do this only with the public data available, so only with the quadratic form and not with the transformation. So let's go into that. So how signing works exactly is that we hash a message to a target and this h is then a bit string of length 2n. And this becomes an element of the, the ring by seeing it um, as a polynomial of length n and you have two copies of it. And then uh, you sample a lattice point. So x that is close to what is this u times h over two. So h over two is um, targets when you multiply it with u. So then if you take the u inverse again, this gives you the, like the coefficients describing the points that's nearby. And what you can see now is so u times s is close to a half u times h. And if you fix s1, this makes s0 times u0 has to be close to this, this thing here. And for this, uh, we know how to do this reasonably well. So you have the round off algorithm of the nearest plane. And we use the, the round off. So if you do the math, you get this formula. You have to round some quantity. And although this u was secret, this q is public. Um, so this can be done in verification. 
And what we had to do here is reject some bad key pairs and where this Q00 was too small. And that made it like this, uh, this round of made it fail like once in a million times. So we had to reject these key pairs and it's like 10% of key pairs had to be rejected. And in that case, the recovery works practically always. And this halved like the signature size by two, or I think even more than two, because the distribution is a bit different between the small F and G and the capital F and G. So uh, how does it perform? Um, yeah, we wrote the uh, implementation in C using some parts of Falcon. And this is uh, isochronous, so almost constant time, except for the encoding and decoding of the signatures and public keys. And as you can see, so everything is almost like twice as fast as Falcon. And the signatures are 20% smaller. And this is in the in the case of a processor having AVX2 support. So that's like high-end devices or just normal desktop PCs. And so Falcon uh, it works when there is no floating point support on the processor. And in that case, uh, you get this performance. So because we only have to multiply things in this in this ring. Uh, with Hawk, we can use the entities in signing, but also in verification. And there we get this uh, factor 15 speed up for signing. And yeah, this is even for the for the batched mode of Falcon. So Falcon considers this performance with signing in a case where you have a lot of signatures uh, signed. And it kind of takes the average of this. It's some pre computation on the secret key. And we, we haven't done this yet, um, but we still compare it. So if you take the unbatched version of Falcon, uh, we have a factor 30 speed up. Um, yeah. So, yeah, some remaining questions. Um, first of all, maybe there are other lattices where um, you kind of can sample closer to a target and maybe get some smaller signatures or um, this kind of stuff. But then uh, the main question is that we want more crypt analysis on this uh, lattice isomorphism problem and how it's like harder reductions to other problems. So we know that if you solve SVP, you found you have the key recovery, but yeah, is there more? Uh, it's quite yeah, interesting to know. So to wrap up, um, yeah, I've shown a signature scheme that hides a rotation of set to the n, and on this lattice, uh, the sampling becomes easier. And we don't have to work with any floating points. And that makes it uh, fast and compact. That's it. Thanks. So, any questions? Uh -uh. Yeah, we, so, it's a very good uh, proposal, I guess. So, but compared to the Bitaka, so I like to ask two points. In Hawk, it can be parallel computation is possible. That's the first question. Second one is what is your idea against side channel attack? Sorry, what was the first question? Parallel computation? Par Parallelized. A, you mean that the all computation is serialized? Serialized computation. Like, you have any idea 
prepared competition in the whole. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> what do you mean? So in your implementation for better performance verification, all operation is done by step by step. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So you don't have no idea on the parallel competition. Um, yeah, um, I guess you can like do some sampling beforehand for every go set. Um, okay. That is possible. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, second <laughs> question is any resistance against side channel attack, for instance, the constant time implementation or others? Uh, yeah, so yeah, we already have uh, isochronous implementation. And it's basically like, yeah, we, we, set, we say this because that's like more accurate than saying it's constant time because this, um, like this signing is so fast that maybe like some 10% is spent on encoding um, the signatures. And so, yeah. <laughs> Like technically, it's not constant time because of this encoding, but uh, this doesn't matter because these signatures become public. So, not, yeah, if anyone cannot learn more about how long this encoding took. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so for this looks a bit like what an MQ was done the whole time and what got rainbow broken, like many schemes, because uh, they also relied on the isomorphism of polynomials problem. So do you have any idea of how secure this uh, lattice isomorphism problem is? Yeah, so we know it's broken for codes, but for lattices, this, yeah, this kind of popped up, I think, like one year or two years ago, that it's like already quite difficult to uh, to do in dimension nine, where uh, like Vessel, he, he computed a lot of different uh, lattices and he wanted to know if they were isomorphic. This was like quite difficult, <laughs> he seems. So it, it looks more promising than like these attacks on codes and that kind of stuff. Okay, so you don't have any reduction that shows that this is uh, maybe as hard as uh, some form of shortest vector problem or so? Uh, no, we don't have these yet. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we still have a bit of time for questions, if there are more. Otherwise, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Finally, the last talk of this session uh, is going to be Bloom. Uh, Bimodal lattice, uh, one out of many proofs and applications by uh, Vadim Lubashevsky and uh, Gokhan Ren. And uh, Khan is going to give the talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks everyone for staying here. Um, my name is Khan and I'm going to talk about Bloom. My model lattice one out of many proofs and applications. So we have seen many lattice based zero knowledge uh, frameworks in the recent years and they use, well, naturally they come with applications. For example, we had approximate proofs or like Kachemir with boards which was hinted in the first talk by Julian. And they naturally come with some nice applications, for example, the Delephium signature, and we also have like verifiable encryption, group signatures, and so on. And then, you know, in 2019, um, we had like algebraic exact proofs, and they 
also come with nice applications with uh, exotic signatures with um, much better signature sizes and so on. And then you know, then we had more and more frameworks with with you know with other applications where you just in in many cases you can just substitute the framework like below and then you get because the framework itself is much better than before then naturally these these uh, primitives this, this privacy preserving applications they are also more efficient than before however it's you know it's interesting more interesting to uh, to kind of make use of the framework and not just use it in a black box manner and that's kind of what we will show with the um, here um, so in in this paper we show efficient one out of many proofs where we Really make use of this of the newest LMP twenty two framework from crypto this year. Um, well, another contribution is we show um, how to prove integer relations such as addition and multiplication. And the nice thing about this compared to previous works is that you, we don't need to commit to the carry vectors, and th that's like a significant improvement. And also, well, because we had the name bimodal in the title. Or well, we use the um, we improve the this framework using bimodal Gaussians, but it's around ten to fifteen percent gain. And well, obviously, one might think that all these uh, you know the, all these things are not really useful in real life. Well, I hope that this the music video has some impact in real life. But um, in this talk, I will only focus on the first bullet points. Okay, so let's start with some preliminaries. As uh, hinted already in the previous talk, uh, we will focus on these cytotomic rings. So let RQ be ZQ of X module X to the D plus one, where D is a part of two. And then we define the automorphism sigma to be the one which maps X to the X inverse. So we will have we have some weird definitions here, and I'll show you in the next few slides why they are interesting. Hopefully. Um, so yeah, so the, the next weird thing is that for a fixed number of variables, let's say k, I define this uh, quadratic automorphic polynomial, this QA polynomial P to be a function for which there exists a 2k variant quadratic polynomial T, such that P of M1 up to MK is equal to T of M1, sigma of M1, M2, sigma of M2 up to MK, sigma of MK. So informally, just think of these QA polynomials as just quadratic polynomials, but we also introduce some, there might be just some uh, sigmas around. For example, M1 times M2 minus sigma of M3, or M1 times sigma of M1 minus X to the D over two plus two. So, okay, so why are they useful? Oh, well, okay, so that's for the next slide. So the simplified LNP22 framework can be, uh, well, can be described like this. So suppose I want to prove knowledge of some short polynomials in RQ, M1 up to MK, which satisfies some relations. So for public QA polynomials, P1 up to PL, we want to prove that for each I, PI of M1, M2 up to MK is equal to zero over RQ. The second one is, let's say, more interesting, but it's also, also not really intuitive. So for public QA polynomials, P1 prime up to PN prime, for each i, the constant coefficient of pi prime of m1 up to mk is equal to zero. So recall that pi prime of m1 up to mk is a polynomial over rq, and we want to prove that the constant coefficient is equal to, let's say, zero. But if, because we are interested in zero knowledge, we don't want to reveal any information about the other coefficients. Uh, and then, yeah, the third thing is proving some various norm bounds. So we want to prove, if you want to prove some L2 norm, or we want to prove some binaries, yeah. Okay, so one might, okay, so now, you know, I guess maybe half or more, the majority of the audience here thinks like, well, what's the point of all these, of all the sigma? Why do we need sigma? Why do we need QA polynomials? Why am I here and what time is the lunch? So, um, well, so I hope in the next slide I can explain a bit. Um, so suppose I want to prove some, you know, basic relations over integers or over ZQ. For example, I want to prove binary. So I have a polynomial M. I want to prove that it has binary coefficients. So the first observation is that this is the case if and only if the inner product of M and M minus one is equal to zero over integers. So basically we would just want to prove the 
this inner product relation. And then to prove that, we use the following lemma, which says that if we have the, the, polyno um, the polynomial vectors x, y, then the constant coefficient of x transpose sigma of y is equal to this exactly the inner product of these coefficient vectors x and y. This means in particular that if we want to prove the inner product, let's say, of m and m minus one, we are interested in the constant coefficient of, okay, does it work? Okay, I'll just use my mouse. Um, this is equivalent to showing that the constant coefficient of m, oh, um, yeah. the constant coefficient of m times sigma of m minus the sum of monomials is equal to zero because the coefficient of coefficient vector of m is m with an arrow and the coefficient vector of m minus the sum of monomials is exactly m minus the one vector. So yeah, and for that, we can just use the second bullet point of the framework. So that's the um, intuition. And similarly with proving linear relations, well, if I want to prove that the inner product of a and m is equal to u, for public a and u, then we just, using the lemma, we just need to prove that the constant coefficient of sigma of a times m minus u is equal to zero. Okay, so now we are ready to discuss some, to discuss the one out of many proofs. So intuitively, we can think of it as some set membership proof. So suppose we have some n values, t1 up to tn, and um, well, in our case, we will pick n to be some base beta to the L. So we want to prove that we know some opening M and R such that for some index I, commitment of M and R is equal to TI. And obviously, we, because we want it to be, well, we want the proof to be zero knowledge. So in particular, we don't want to reveal any information about uh, the index I. So yeah, so it's time for some technical overview, put the members in the matrix, call it U. So we put these values as a columns of that matrix, uh, multiply by the selector, name it V. So we would define this vector V to be the, the, vector, the binary vector, which has one in the i position. And that's a linear equation, it's easy to see. Well, now it's not really easy to see, but if we define a lattice-based commitment, then maybe it's easier. So if we define the commitment to be AM plus BR, then the right-hand side is the matrix, the matrix U, which consists of these columns, T1, T2, up to Tn, times the selector vector, which has one in the i position. So the right-hand side is just U times V. So we don't want to commit to it, that's linear size. So the, the vector V has length N, so we recall n is b to the l. So we tensor decompose into small vi's. So here the trick, which was used in the original paper by Grof and Kolweis, and then in matrix, matrix plus, smile, and so on. Um, the, the key idea is that if we have this vector i, which has exactly one, one, and all zeros in all the other places, then we can tensor decompose it into smaller vectors vi's, where each vi has dimension as length beta, it's binary and it has exactly one one. So for example, yeah, it's a very small example. The zero one zero zero vector can be decomposed as one zero tensor zero one. So, okay, if I put M and R together and A and B together, then basically we just want to prove equations like AS is equal to U times V1 tensor V2 tensor up to VL. So to do this, first we, we do the standard trick. Well, if I want to prove this equation, I will just, I will get the random vector as a challenge and I will do the inner product and prove that the inner product is equal to zero. So what do we get? So, so what I described is the first line of this equation um, where the phi is this random vector. And then the second line is, I will just move the matrices around from the left to right. So at the beginning, I had the U on the left-hand side. Now I have U on the right-hand side. Uh, the same with A. And then the third line is a little bit more complicated. So for the third line, we will use the following lemma, which says that 
if I have some vectors a and b, a has dimensions n and b has dimension m, and w has length n times m, and I can write this as sub vectors w1 up to wn. Then the inner product of a tensor b with w is equal to the inner product of a and the matrix w1 transpose w2 transpose up to wn transpose times b. So it just, well, nothing too complicated. Um, so to use this lemma, well, we set A to be V1. Uh, we set B to be V2 transpose, uh, V2 tensor up to VL, yeah, to be, uh, to be B, and W is the U transpose phi. So, so that's, um, so we get the U bar. Okay, so now the idea is that we will, we will commit, well, informally, we will commit to X1, which is that complicated term, in the inner product, which is u bar uh, times v2 tensor v3 up to vl. And then there are two things to prove. So I mean, the first one is to prove well formness of x1. So we want to prove that x1 is indeed equal to u bar times v2 transpose uh, tensor up to vl. And basically, we want to prove the equation, right? So we want to prove that 0 is equal to the inner product of v1 x1 minus s a transpose phi. So focus, let's focus on the case beta is equal to D. So that we have these two equations to prove. And OK, so the second one, uh, we can see that it's, it's kind of equivalent to proving that the constant coefficient of sigma of V1 times X1 minus sigma of A transpose phi transpose S is equal to 0. Um, yeah, here I abuse the notation a bit because A transpose phi is a vector. But what I would do is just I'll just map it to the polynomial vector and then take the transpose. Um, okay, but for the first one, well, it still it still looks complicated. However, it's kind of a very very similar statement to what we are actually started from, and we can use the same idea by recursion. So so maybe so now I have some x1, but later on I will get the x2, x3 up to x beta. It's a typo, but each of each of them has length d. Or like, oh, oh, yeah, it should be l. Um, so yeah, obviously we still need to prove. I don't know that the s has short norm, or the vi's have binary uh, coefficients, or, and all vi's have exactly one one. But this can be covered by the framework. So if we if we just consider the soundness error, then, well, if this original statement wasn't true, then this inner product, uh, this uh, yeah, inner product check with a linear random combination, this basically this equation uh, would be true with probability at most one over Q. So what happens if it's not negligible? For example, if Q is two to the sixty-four, then do we need to repeat it twice? Which would be a bit costly. So we would. We briefly describe how how to achieve this one shot property. Um, so let's set the base to be D over two, and I will commit to the polynomials W i, which for which the coefficient vector consists of the V i and the zero. So let's look at the right hand, yeah, the right hand side of the of the slide. So I have the W one, the coefficient vector, the, I know the top, like the first part of the coefficient vector is v1 and the rest are is zeros and the nice thing of that which we will use is that if i multiply w1 of x to the d over 2 then the second part will shift to the first part but with the minus but it's still zero and then the top part will move to the bottom part which, so it will be v1 okay so let me let me just run the proof with two random uh, vectors, phi zero and phi one. And I will end up with these two, two systems of, of equations. So let me just focus, and, oh, okay. And I will also commit to x one, which now contains x one zero and x one one. So we want to prove these four equations. So let's just go step by step. So let's start with the blue one. So what I claim, is that the blue equation 
is equivalent to proving, well, is equivalent to the constant coefficient of this blue polynomial is equal to zero, which is sigma of w1 x1 minus sigma of a transpose phi zero transpose s. And why, why is it the case? Well, the main observation is that the inner product of v1 x1 zero is equal to the inner product of w1 x1. So why? Because if we just look at the w1 and x1, the coefficient vectors of it, then the inner product will be exactly v1 times x1 zero plus zero times x11, which is exactly what we wanted. And then to prove the, and then we focus on the orange part. So I want to say that this orange equation is equivalent to the constant coefficient of the sigma of x to the, to the d over two times w1 times x1 minus sigma of a transpose by one transpose s is equal to zero. And here it's kind of similar idea. So we want, so we claim that we just need to show that the inner product of v1 and x11 is equal to the inner product of x to the d over two times w1 and one and x1. And we can see it here. So if we look at the, the, um, the coefficient vectors of x to the d over two times w1 and x1, that it's zero times x10 thus v1 times x11. So, so yeah. And then to prove these, these things, we can just use the framework. Um, so yes, the last part is the purple equations. Uh, just by combining them, we can see that uh, it's equivalent to x1 being u0 bar, u1 bar times v2 tensor, v3 tensor up to vl. And because we, we have one less tensor, we can just continue with the strategy with because. So yeah, so um, just briefly about performance, I guess I'm out of time. Um, so yeah, so one of the many proofs can be used directly to build ring signatures and group signatures. Um, this work, uh, our scheme really scales well with big sizes, ring signature sizes. Uh, so even for more than for around two to 21, um, it's moderately better than SMILE and all the other falafel matrix and calamari. And the nice thing compared to the lattice ones is that we have very small public key sizes. So around uh, 0 0.1 kilobytes. Um, just to showcase the integer relations uh, proofs, um, thanks to the fact that we don't need to commit to these carry vectors, we get more than a factor of two improvement compared to the prior work. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. And uh, that concludes my talk. So we have time for questions. So apparently uh, people are hungry, so let's thank the speaker again.